question to me before, and never, uh, because I actually saw this when I, or that film when I was a very young kid and didn't see it again since, but every single Q&A somebody asks Alessandro about it, I, I gotta go back and revisit. I'm, I'm so sorry, I feel like I've, I've done you wrong. First of all, how many people have seen Face Off? I mean, I've seen it, but it's just been a while. Sure, and we all agree, I mean, the movie's amazing, Face Off. We can talk all night about Face Off, we'll let me move on. Talk a little about the genesis of the project. Where did this idea come from? Uh, let's start with that. Uh, I've been doing jujitsu now for six years, but when I started writing the script, I had been doing it for about two. And it was a hobby, but it wasn't like a full-blown passion, like part of my life. But it was enough that I really thought that it could be fun to set something in the world of martial arts. Uh, but I knew that if I did that, I didn't want to do a traditional martial arts film, like a sports movie, uh, where everything kind of like, there's, there's a character that's beaten down in the beginning and they build themselves back up. There's a really great montage. They learn everything they need to know and they defeat the bad guy in the end. Wanted to do something that subverted that expectation. And then also, I, at the time I was really starting to kind of, it was more of an internal monologue of myself, like question who I was as a man, question uh, uh, society's expectations of men and what we were doing and like how we were encouraging each other and not encouraging each other and all those like, things that felt really personal seep their way into the script uh, and then come to find that a lot of guys feel this way and a lot of guys, I mean there's a Tom Hardy quote that I, I rediscovered recently that I put in my director's kind of statement in, in when I was pitching this, this script and he talked about very similar things. It was almost like creepy how much it felt uh, like I, I, I felt like it was for me but he said something about like he doesn't like to go to the gym because he feels like other men uh, intimidate him and and he, he's afraid to be around them, but he knew that he's an actor, he can imi imitate them. And that's what he kind of like, uh, I, I guess that's how he goes about life. It's like, I, whatever I'm afraid of, I like find a way to become. And I really liked that, and it just kind of mirrored what I was already writing. So uh, it, it, it was good to know that other people felt that way. And, and since then, I've talked to women who relate to it in a different way than I kind of intended and uh, people who are trans who are relating to it in a very different way. It's been really cool to see that this personal story has related to people in, in ways that I wouldn't have imagined. Uh, how tough was it to get financing? I mean, in, in general, like, okay, so the first step is finding a producer. And on fault, I had producers who ended up financing the film. It was very, like, no, not too many cooks in the kitchen type of deal. Fault is my first feature, sorry. Uh, this, this one though, it, yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, I, this, this one though, I, I met the producer who ended up making the film, Andrew Korshak, first. He was the first person that my one of my agents uh, sent it to. And he loved it, but at the time he was doing a couple of films and it was just gonna take up too much time and he felt like he couldn't give me uh, enough time. He felt like he, he just didn't want to do me a disservice by saying, I'll do this movie and then it gets put on the back burner. So I ended up meeting with a lot of other people over the course of about a year, and it went through, like some people loved it, but wanted changes. Some people didn't get it, like, how are you gonna make karate look cool? And I was like, that's not the point of the movie. Like, there's so many other things that are going on, that's, that's definitely not what I'm trying to do. Uh, but then a year later, those things that Andrew was about to do kind of got put on the back burner themselves, and I circled back and I was like, do you wanna do this? And he said, yeah, fuck yeah, let's just do it. And so he came on, uh, his company ended up financing, and <coughs> two movies in a row, in a row now, I've, I've had the same producer also be the financier, and it never works out that way, and it's happened twice now, and I've been very lucky, uh, and it affords me a certain level of uh, creative control, uh, I, and just also trust that like they know what I'm making, and they're totally behind it, and I haven't been beholden to too many uh, outside forces. I, I know I'm very lucky, but I also, uh, it, it's, it's just been, I don't know, it, it's, it's kind of the perfect storm of everything, but I, I'm, I'm hoping to go forward kind of in that direction and just kind of keep being, finding people who are passionate about what I want to make and then also uh, give me the right like push and notes and everything, but, but uh, yeah, just keep moving forward. How, uh, talk a little bit about casting with Jesse Eisenberg. The film just doesn't work without your lead actor. What was it about Jesse that said, I, I can be even, how critical was he in getting the finances together? Um, well, Jesse came on board uh, after about that, we had about a year with that producer, Andrew, where we were sending it to people, but they were all in that, I, I had this, this idea in my head that I wanted the character be in, to be in his 40s. 
or, or older, potentially. I really liked the idea that it, it, it was going to be more sad and pathetic that a guy that was a little bit older really didn't feel like a man still. And I also liked the idea, too, that he would be in a karate gi doing karate with teenagers and kids. And uh, I just I felt like that was a funnier image. Uh, but a lot of those guys just didn't get it and didn't or, or were afraid of it. I had one uh, particular actor, I won't say his name, but you all know who he is, who <laughs> said that he loved the script, but he couldn't play a weak character at that point in time. And it just like reinforced the idea that I was making the right movie. Like this was the, a topic that really <laughs> needed to, to be talked about. And I, I, I assume he wanted some Marvel movie or something after this, and this was gonna make him look bad for that. But uh, we kind of went back to the drawing board and went after people uh, who are my age. I'm 33, I was 31 when I started making this, and uh, Jesse was the first person that came up when we went to that age group. And it was one of those things where I almost thought, there's no way we can get him, are you sure? Like, are, are we wasting our time? Uh, but to his credit, Jesse read it, it, we sent it to him on a Friday, he read it over a long weekend, and that Tuesday he wrote me saying, I wanna be in this, I'll do anything, uh, thank you for thinking of me. And uh, after that, too, we were two months later, because of his schedule, two months later we were in Louisville, Kentucky, prepping the film and then shooting. Uh, so that was in like late, <coughs> or sorry, early July, we were shooting September 11th of 2017. So not a lot of prep, but, oh, and also Jesse, Jesse's great. He's super honest, but he was like, uh, and, and okay, so it's gonna be a quick turnaround. I was like, yeah, it's gonna be really quick, but I think we can do it. And he's like, and you think you can make a good movie in that amount of time? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, I hope so, but uh, he's like, oh, interesting, okay, fascinating. Uh, <laughs> he's great, I love that guy, but he's, he's honest to a fault, and uh, got me a little scared, but also just, I, I was motivated, and I knew we could do it. And, uh, there, was a, there was a budget that was kind of working with Jesse, and then Bleecker Street came on, and they said, we want to buy this movie before you even make it. Oh. Uh, so Bleecker Street came on board. Uh, that was, we already had financing, but that made sure that everything was good. And uh, Bleecker Street's been involved from day one. They've been incredible. They've marketed this film that nobody else probably would have taken on, if, or especially sight unseen. And uh, I love uh, where, where, we, where we're at. Like the fact that I'm in Arclight right now, I walk here from my apartment. I've come here all the time. <laughs> and to be here right now with like, people <laughs> that you learn making a feature, because at that point, I, the longest shoot I had ever done was two days, uh, starting starting in, going into that feature. And I'd, I'd made three shorts, uh, and the third one, the one that actually like felt more like me and, and got this movie, or sorry, got Falls made, uh, I only shot for half a day. That was, a, that was Cult the Cup, and that was the one that got in Sundance and introduced me to the producers who made that film. Um, but Falls was an 18-day shoot, and I was scared shitless going into that movie, so thinking, what if I can't do it? Like physically, what if I can't do it? And then mentally, what if I can't do it? And first day was super stressful. We got everything we needed, but I also just felt like I, I kind of was, I don't know, there, there's like this bit of adrenaline that's going through and, and you're missing shots and you realize it after the fact. Uh, and then you kind of calm down, you get into your, your rhythm, and then before you know it, you're done and you're editing and all of a sudden you've made a movie. And I think the biggest thing going into this movie was knowing that I could do it uh, we were a 25 day shoot as opposed to 18. Still not a lot compared to how much we had to shoot. And we've got stunts, we've got dogs, we've got kids and uh, motorcycles and everything. And uh, it, it all added up and we definitely had a few hard days, but I think every indie does. Uh, whether it's people in a room talking and you've got a lot of dialogue to get through or it's all the stunts. Uh, but it really was this, this physical and mental uh, awareness of what it takes and the next film, hopefully I get a little bit more time to be able to slow down and concentrate on certain things that I would like to, to, to I guess, expand upon the next, for the next film. But um, yeah, that, that would be the biggest thing. And, and then just in the edit, you know how long it takes to do a sound mix. You know how long it takes to do color. And, and if something's scheduled too short, you can say, I think I need probably another day. Or uh, just, just having that confidence to know what it, what it takes. Uh, talk a little bit about I just want to jump to the dialogue. I love the dialogue in this movie. Um, talk a little bit about writing it and where, how challenging was it to get this kind of uh, stuff on screen? I had to trust, uh, so uh, I guess
guess I'll start here. So Faults is similar in tone, it's definitely a dark comedy, but it is way more grounded. Um, and I did that by design. I knew that there was no way that a tone like this, uh, and as, as kind of as wild as this movie gets, that I would be able to get that made based off of the short that I had made. Um, so I, I really, with the first feature, kind of just toned it down a little bit. And I remember reviews saying, some reviews saying, I wish you would have pushed it further. And I kind of was like, just you wait. <laughs> There's gonna be a dog that understands the concept of your other left at some point. Like, I'm gonna put that in there. Um, but with this movie, I really just wanted to push it, and I wanted to do something that felt more like me and what I'd always wanted to do. So in a weird way, I, I, obviously, Faults is my first feature. In a weird way, this feels like the first one that's fully me. And a lot of that was just trusting the dialogue and trusting that uh, I, I, I was gonna push it, but also that the actors would be there and trust me. And um, really, a lot of it comes down to everything had to be said literal. Uh, I knew as I was writing it that, that it was it was very specific and very black and white in the way that the characters think and, and react to each other. But if anything was played too broad or sometimes too subtle, you would lose that nuance that you were hopefully going for or that I was hopefully going for. Um, uh, but with the actors, it was often bringing it back. Uh, so even if there would be something that they would do that would get a laugh or there would be a physicality thing that they would do uh, that, that the crew would respond to, uh, it, it's it's always your nature to say, oh, that worked. But on set, often it was bringing it back, and them, to their credit, trusting me to say, I, I, I know what the overall tone should be, and juggling that uh, is is like my job. That's the main job for me is tone. Um, and yeah, the Frank Oz actually came out, up to me after one of the Q and A's that I did at South by Southwest, and said something along the lines of, like, I enjoyed the film. Uh, can never tell an audience when to laugh or it's not going to be funny. And he felt like that was what we did with this movie, in, in that we didn't tell people when to laugh. And uh, it, whether it's a rolling of the eyes or a character kind of going like, huh, or like even a smirk or something, we didn't really want that. We wanted the audience to decide. I didn't want the score to decide for the audience no. to. All of those things are factors going into juggling the tone. And uh, it's, a, it's a tricky thing, but it's something I enjoy doing. Uh, ultimately, the editing room is the final way to write. Uh, you get in the editing room on your first day, or after you have your, let's say your first cut together. How scared are you, or are you like, oh, we got it? Um, Sarah Beth is actually in the audience. Sarah Beth Shapiro is my editor. And <laughs> She was there every day on set to just make sure that things are going smoothly, that I, if I had any concerns, I could bring them up to her, vice versa. She was grabbing drives, but uh, predominantly she was in at her hotel room, which was adjacent to mine. So every once in a while, I would, I would hear her exclaim in excitement when she would listen to a take that worked really perfectly, and I could hear it through my wall, and I'd be like almost asleep, and then I'd wake up and I'd be like, oh, okay, that's it. That's it. Like that. um, but uh, she showed me her cut, uh, which was, she got her editor's cut, and I had gone to uh, Europe for just like a quick trip to just get away and not think about the film for a second, give her her thing, and then I came back and I watched it. I think a lot of directors, especially with their first film, are very, very nervous about their editor's cut, and they're very nervous because they haven't touched it, uh, and things can be different, and they obviously are going to be different than what you're going to do when you take over, or sorry, when you work with your editor and it's, it's predominantly your vision coming through, um, but I watched it with Sarah Beth knowing we got everything we needed. She had already told me about a couple of things that she thought we should go back and get while we were shooting, so we got those while we were shooting. And I watched her cut and I was like, this is the movie. And I think the coolest thing was that I'd only made faults and I'd, I, it had been five years, or sorry, I guess between South by Southwest where we premiered with that movie and South by Southwest this year, but this movie was five years. And so it had been a while since I made a movie and it was a really cool feeling, and it's not gonna make sense in, in some ways probably to people sitting in the audience, but I watched that first cut and I, was, I remember thinking, oh man, this is my movie. Like it looks like my stuff. And I'd only seen faults at that point. I'd only made faults and only had that reference for what I make as a feature, and now I've got another one, and I, I had this like realization that this was mine. And that was a really cool thing. And uh, it's, it's a hard thing to describe, but it, it, it felt great. And I knew that it was only gonna get better from that point. And she did things in there that I never would have done uh, that made it better. 
and then the vice versa. I went in and like tweaked a couple of things where she was like, oh man, I see what you mean now. Like that was that was a really great thing, but particularly with our fight scenes, Sarah Beth is an action like expert. <laughs> and like the, I, I, I just it was one of those things that I don't think she'd ever really cut a fight scene like this before, but if she isn't offered gigantic action movies based off of some of the fight scenes in this movie, I'm gonna be like very disappointed. You then, at some point, you're showing it to friends and family or you're doing a test screen. Uh, who did you show, who was in that first, the, that first time you show it, who were the friends and family you trust, and what did you learn from that that maybe impacted the finished film? Um, I, mean, I had a lot of people come in, pretty much all of our thanks uh, for the film. Uh, anytime you see a director pop up, they were one of the people that watched the film. Uh, David Lowry was at one of our first screenings. Pat Candler's in the audience. Uh, I saw her before we popped in. Uh, uh, Hannah Fidel. People that I kind of went through Sundance with or like premiered South by with and uh, filmmakers that you trust and, and are your peers. And then also it's very important to bring in people that you don't know or the producers know but you don't know. Uh, I also really like to, especially for the first director's cut, like the first official cut that producers know you're showing to people, because you do secret screenings for friends that they don't know about, and that's part of the game. But, uh, they, they, and they understand it. But our first official director's cut screening, uh, I do like to bring in people who have done a feature before, and I think that there's a difference between making a short and making a feature and understanding what there is to accomplish what you're limited by. Uh, we had Sean Watts there, we, we did, uh, did the new Spider-Man. Um, people who's, who, who I didn't know, but then John Watts was the one who laughed hysterically at the penis on screen. And so I was like, oh, I like that guy, that's good. That's good. Um, I, 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 it's, it's important to bring in people you don't know, people you do know, and then also be prepared to not listen to anything they say, and then all of a sudden be like, whoa, that one thing they said is perfect. And uh, all of them have been through the, or, or around the block and they know what they're talking about. And uh, it's really just about listening. So did you make any changes as a result of those early screenings? Like just stuff you didn't even realize and they just nailed it? I would say it's hard to, or it's hard to say that anything was a, like I didn't even think of that sort of thing. More often than not, it reinforces ideas that you're already feeling. The, the biggest thing is that our French scene in the beginning of the film that was much longer in the script. Uh, and it was more of a game where uh, they were going back and forth and making fun of him, but she starts getting uncomfortable. And it's like this man putting his, like forcing her to continue to play the game. So it's going along with the theme of, of a man's kind of uh, oppression of a woman, but in a way that didn't really serve the joke of that scene. And also it, it was just too long and I felt like we needed to get into the rest of the movie. So we realized that the joke of that scene really is that they're making fun of him, he understands. That's the punch, it's set up in punchline. So we got the uh, the minimum amount of footage that represented that joke and then got on with the rest of the movie. I, I, I think I, I had it in my mind that I wanted to do something similar to the beginning of Faults, which is where you've got a character that's introduced with a scene that doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the plot other than introduce them, it introduces their character and predominantly their big flaw. So in Faults, it was that he's, he's just like destitute and his life is going nowhere and he's a scavenger. That's what that scene's about. This scene is about a man who knows exactly what somebody's saying about him. They're tearing him down, and uh, he is so cowardly and has no spine that he just like accepts it. And, and, and uh, that's what that scene was about for me, so we just needed that and didn't get out of it. And that was a big thing from the test screening, that they just reinforced that uh, mainly that the film needed to be shorter, but also get on with the rest of the movie. Uh, I know you mentioned you only shot for 25 days. Did you have any deleted scenes? Uh, there's deleted pieces of scenes, but every scene that I write um, to a fault, it, it can actually be tricky sometimes, is that every scene has to be there because there's information that leads to the next scene or comes back later in the movie. Even like a seemingly insignificant thing, if you take it out, uh, it, it ruins the setup and its payoff, or sorry, it's a setup that ruins the payoff later. Uh, so I know that there are people who think, like, you could easily cut 10 minutes from this movie. I, I know that you could probably cut things here and there. Some of that's just stylistic stuff that I want to be there, but there are no other scenes that could be cut without ruining a punchline that happens or um, a big plot point that happens later on. The only scene that we cut is that after Casey gets his black stripe on, uh, for going to the night class from Sensei, 
he steps out into the hallway, kind of in the main dojo part, and David Zellner, Henry, who ends up hanging himself, he, he wants to be in the night class, but he can't be, uh, he ends up walking past, kind of smiles, and then looks down comedically, sees the black stripe, and then like Charlie Brown walks away. And I really liked it, and it was really funny to me, and it kind of went along with the, the whole idea while I was shooting the movie that it was like a fucked up after school special, like where everything about an after school special happens in this movie, it just gets darker, darker, darker mm -hmm. instead of that. Um, it felt like that type of scene, and I really enjoyed it, but it was 30 seconds that we didn't need, and that's the only full scene that was in this movie. Uh, before the movie begins, you're, you're going on set the first day. What are you most nervous to be able to accomplish with your obviously limited budget and limited schedule? Uh, I mean, the fight scenes were definitely uh, things that I was looking for. They were, it was a predominantly um, chronological shoot, so all the stuff in the beginning of the movie was in the beginning of the shoot for the most part, and all of the fight scenes near the end of the movie were near the end. I, I think we were all looking at that big cop, uh, undercover cop scene with the fight, with motorcycles. We had a process trailer. We were gonna have to go around the block with, with the character, or uh, two of our actors on the back of the process trailer on a motorcycle. Uh, it, that was a big day, and we all looked at that like, how are we gonna do it? Like, well, at least it's not here yet. Like, at least we've got another week, and then you finish a week, and you're like, at least that's only a week away, and then you're like, oh damn, that's gonna be on Wednesday. And then by the time you get to it, you just have to do it. And the, the great thing is that it's not just me, it's not just my cinematographer, everyone's there trying to accomplish the same task. And our Kentucky crew, our movable Kentucky crew, and then adjacent cities, uh, they just knocked it out of the park. They knew what we needed. Everyone was there for a reason, and it was not money, I guarantee you. Uh, it, it wouldn't have worked without them, but uh, yeah, those those big fight scene days were always tough. Uh, Imogen's big fight scene, uh, the first night class that we see, that one was a brutal day, and it's all handheld because we just had to do it that way, or else we wouldn't have gotten it. And then uh, we had to get that done before lunch, and then after lunch we had a huge dialogue scene. So, it's not just that on, on any other film you'd spend days doing one fight scene. We had to do it before lunch and then after lunch switch gears and do something completely different. And that's always a challenge, but uh, it's one that we kind of know going into. And, and uh, hopefully the next film I get 30 days instead of 25 days. It's just like progressively getting longer. Uh, obviously you had a limited amount of takes that you could do on this film. Did you, are there any first takes that you just did one take and you're like, we're moving on, and what was the most amount of takes you did? Uh, on Fault, I was really good about remembering what the, the one take wonders were. Um, Mary's really good at that. Leland can knock it out of the park on certain things where you're just like, holy shit, that one, that was his first, that was the first take? Okay, we'll move on. Um, but on this one, I'm, I'm blanking on ones that would t for sure be first takes, or one takes. Uh, we definitely had them. If I see it and it works and we all agree, then we move on. Like, there's no reason, especially on days that are tricky and are going to be longer, to kind of keep just like going after it again and again. Uh, but I do know that one of the ones that we took the longest uh, amount of time on, and Jesse, like, was a trooper, I feel like it's a hard scene or a hard shot, was when he punches his boss in the throat. He has this crazy monologue after it. So, first thing you have to get is the punch has to be framed right so that it looks like he's hitting his boss in the throat. And then the monologue itself is so ridiculous and Jesse has to kind of perform it as if he's practiced all morning in front of the mirror as Casey is like saying, okay, this is how I'm gonna say that it, it, and it's gonna be really tough and that's my version of a tough guy talking. Uh, so it's, it's actorly uh, to like a crazy degree. Uh, and then he had, any time he got, because in it he says, uh, I, instead of uh, doing that, I'm gonna go home and masturbate to the thought of your wife wearing her bathing suit at the bar barbecue. Everything about that is just tricky on its own, but then he, he decided he wanted to put a pause in there and then say her name, which also made it funnier to him, but then it got trickier. Uh, he did like 18 takes of that one thing, and I think it's gonna be a blooper reel thing. Like, it's not a blooper reel movie, but that one particular scene was just so good, and he was, he was beating himself up and in a way that was funny, and at a certain point he was just like, God, need to get through this and then we never really like worried but at the same time it, it, it did take a while and then you do eight <coughs> scenes and then you end up going back and watching it in the edit and they're like oh actually take seven was really good let's use take seven so like that happens a lot too but um it's part of the game 
I'm definitely curious what you've been writing uh, since you wrapped on this. Uh, in August, I, I went to San Diego for a week and started writing this thing that I've been thinking about for about a year called Duel. It's spelled D-U-A-L. Uh, but it's it's a clone, like a pseudo sci-fi thing that it deals with cloning. Uh, it's a lead actress, and uh, I'm really excited. It's like a dark comedy in the vein of Falls toward this, uh, and in a lot of ways it's darker than this, but in some ways it's funnier. Uh, and I'm and there's there's no karate at least, but there there may be a little fighting. Um, and we've got producers on it, but uh, we haven't announced that yet. But I'm super psyched because they're amazing. And uh, in the casting process right now, so trying to figure that out, but hopefully Oh, so this, this is probably your next film. Oh, the duel is the next film. <laughs> uh, uh, I definitely want to make sure that if there's anyone in the audience who has a question. What draws you to the, <clears throat> the dark comedy, and um, what more than the dark comedy, you talked about men feeling insecure and all that. Could you talk a little bit more about how the dark comedy uh, interacts with the uh, the honesty of your story? Uh, so the question is about uh, why I'm drawn to dark comedy. I think, uh, and, and then I'll just touch on the other one too. Um, I really just like the idea, of, well, first of all, it's the type of film that I love to watch the most is, is a dark comedy. I love Paul Thomas Anderson, I love <coughs> Lanthimos and Hal Ashby, but uh, I, I really feel like there's, there's something about real life that is darkly comedic always. And you have those days that you're just like, it feels like a movie, it feels like life's beating me down, but you can find a, hu a bit of humor in that. Uh, with a movie, you get to push it further. And I really just like the idea of, or the, the freedom to be able to build your own world and uh, build off of, um, I don't know, these, these like crazy ideas and then kind of say, well, that's a rule in the world. And, and I like playing with rules and I like uh, doling out those rules a little bit as you go, not changing them or anything, but like just not presenting them all up front. Uh, and the second question was about uh, masculinity and how it kind of, or, or the, the topic of like how uh, if you, sorry, if you're, if, like how, how dealing with masculinity and, and how not feeling like a man. Relate and how, how you get your other point out across, which is one of the things that drove you to, I think you said to make this movie. Um, I mean, I, I like to think that I can make fun of myself. And so part, I mean, it's a, it's a personal film, but, uh, I think it's something that I'm realizing more people can relate to, and uh, I don't know. Like the, uh, a lot of my passions are in here. It's a cross section of my brain. I love metal. I do martial arts. Uh, I am a man, uh, even though my name is Riley. And uh, even at, a, at Munich uh, Film Festival, someone raised their hand and they had a question. And they said, well, "I just wanted to say I was going to ask a question, but I figured it might as well be a comment." Um, your name was in the program, and I assumed you were a woman. And then when you walked out, I realized you were a man. So I thought that was funny that your character. And I don't think I totally realized that I was doing that on purpose, but uh, I think that that ended up happening. Uh, I, I think it's just a, a way of making fun of yourself and also um, kind of saying that there's there's a, I don't know, that, that, yeah, guys are silly. And, and I think we take ourselves too serious a lot of the times. And I think that metal takes itself too seriously. And martial arts takes itself too seriously. Uh, it's just more fun to play around. I probably didn't answer your question. Are you a black belt? I, I'm a purple belt in jiu-jitsu, which is like halfway through the system, okay. so, but yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the date of the film is never spelled out, but the technology seemed like it was from 20 or 30 years ago. Why was that? Uh, technology in the film, uh, I, I've had people ask if it was in the 90s, if it was the 80s. Uh, it was more about not dating the film in the future, so I've got, VCRs and, and tapes and then cassette, or, uh, sorry, and CDs and cars from the 2000s and CRT monitors, everything in between, because I really just wanted it to feel like it could be timeless. Yeah. And so I, if I'm so lucky that people in 10 years are watching the film. I would hope that they're not looking at it and saying, oh, that cell phone is an I iPhone 7, so that means that phone came out in whatever, 2015. I don't want people thinking about that, but then I guess the opposite is starting to happen where people are thinking about that. So I don't know if I totally succeeded, but the idea was just to kind of uh, make it timeless, but then also help build a world where any type of technology can exist and and uh, then set up then, like, it's not that crazy if somebody kicks a tire and it explodes. Like, it's just all pieces of a of larger puzzle. Uh, right here. I just want to say that I came into it with my husband not knowing anything about the movie and I didn't want to see a trailer and I thought it was amazing. Like I loved it. 
but um, I also wanted to ask, did uh, Jesse and Imogen have any experience with karate, or did they have to go through like some training? The question is about the experience of the actors with karate, and um, Jesse came on, uh, Jesse is the first person to say he hates exercising and doing anything <laughs> athletic. He's good at talking, though. He's great at talking. But uh, he did some training. I actually was there for his first karate class, uh, which was new to me, too, because all of what I do is on the ground, so it's not kicking and punching. Uh, and we were both equally bad at it. But Mindy Kelly, our stunt coordinator, pushed him, had about a month and a half to work with him, uh, and then Imogen, about a similar amount of time, she actually flew out to New York and worked with them for a little while. And then Alessandro came on board three days before the shoot, and his first day was doing his first scene, which is the monologue where he's talking in karate. And uh, he nailed it, and it was one of those things where I don't think anybody else could have done it the way that he did, and we're so lucky that he came in and, and was as motivated as he was, but nobody had training. They just are all good actors, and they've also all done action films, so they were prepared to learn the choreography. On that note, uh, we actually have to wrap up, and I'm just gonna say, if you enjoyed the movie, please go on social media and say something. And, uh, and talk to your friends, too, yeah. That, um, really, like oh. <laughs> or text them. <laughs> yeah. But no, seriously, this is the kind of movie that you can always use support on social. So if you enjoyed it, please go out there and uh, uh, say something. Thank you guys so much. I don't know all of you, but I really appreciate it.